About one in five Australians owns a dog. That amounts to more than five million canines. Constant companions for many, for most farmers, they're indispensable workers. We've even developed some world famous breeds, the Kelpie and the Australian cattle dog in particular. Reporter Tim Lee got on the scent of an author determined to set the record straight over the disputed origins of the Blue Healer. The upper reaches of the Colo River, northwest of Sydney, is a special place for Bernadette Merchant. For years, she has given her dogs a daily frolic in the cool waters. The region also holds a special, if little known, place in Australian history. This tough bush environment helped mould one of our most famous breeds of dog, the Australian cattle dog. The original Australian working dog developed for the hard, hot, early conditions in colonial Australia. It's commonly called the blue or red healer, depending on the colour of the coat, which in this case can be either. And it may or may not have a tail, but we'll come to that later. The cattle dog's origins are full of legend and more than a little muddy by myth. In fact, much of the history of Australia's dogs seemed riddled with tall tails. Take, for instance, the influential book, Australian Barkers and Biters. I read that book as a boy, it was in my school library, and I loved that book when I was a young fellow. I loved that book, I thought it was fantastic. But as I, as I grew up and owned dogs, and I, couldn't, I, just, I just began to question it. And after a while I realised it was nonsense. In the open doorknobs, class 11, the so into this ring stepped Guy Hull, a dog behavioralist. In other words, he helps owners who have problem dogs, or simply problems with their dog. First, he sunk his teeth into the origins of the healer. After all, that was where the bug first bit. Well, I knew that the Australian catalogue wasn't part collies, we'd all been told. So over the years, you know, I've in increased my knowledge and 20 years later, basically, I was ready to write the book. The Dogs That Made Australia examines the role that dogs have played in our nation's development. Guy Hull contends that dogs were indispensable. From the moment the officers of the First Fleet planted their stockinged feet on Australian shores in 1788, he argues the ill-equipped colonisers may have starved but for their kangaroo-catching dogs. The first fleet, the first colonists were on the verge of starvation. It was a long time before the second fleet turned up. And if it wasn't for the dogs, that they brought for sporting purposes. They brought hounds, Scottish hounds and Scottish wire-haired hounds, or deer hounds and the Scottish wire-haired greyhound. And they brought your st normal standard smooth-haired greyhound. If it wasn't for those dogs, they would have been in big trouble, like serious trouble. So firearms back then were smooth board, board muskets, which were useless for hunting. So dogs were actually able to do the work that, um, that hunters couldn't, couldn't achieve. And they did it that effectively, they kept people fed, particularly in Van Diemen's Land, which we know as Tasmania today. The colony of New South Wales expanded, but not as rapidly as its cattle herds. And here again, the English imported dogs found the going too tough. The problem was that they brought over cattle working dogs, that, British, British working dogs, that were heavy coated dogs, that we only used to work in quiet domesticated cattle over relatively short distances. They bring them to Australia, it's flint hard, it's dry, it's in drought most of the time, and they were dealing with wild and semi wild cattle, horned beasts that were, you know, quite independent, objected to being worked, they would stand up to dogs, so they needed a tough dog, and the dogs that they were using the bobtail mostly, and colleagues could not cope with, with um, wild cattle and semi-wild cattle. So they needed someone to come up with something more potent than what they had. So you need something that's going to go all day, be able to climb up over rocks, keep the cattle under control, and actually probably not even let the cattle go in that area. So you need brains as well as the working ability. The solution was right under their snouts. 
interbreeding a dog with the dingo. That fact is well established, but how is it that this wild, untamable creature was successfully incorporated into a domestic breed? Guy Hull needed expert dog breeding knowledge. His quest quickly brought him to Queensland's Darling Downs and the home of Tony Parsons, author, former farmer and journalist, known affectionately as Mr Kelpie. Hey, Guy. Hey, Tony, how are you, mate? Great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again, yeah, too. Yeah, have, a, have a good trip. <laughs> Look, there was a love-hate relationship with the dingo. They admired the dingo, but they hated it because it was, it was you know, the very devil on sheep. So, But it was had the, all the, the durability that you needed for Australia. It was terribly hardy. It was um, physically tremendous, you know, like we could go all day, you know, virtually. And... Um, uh, was built was a built the way you want a dog to be built for physical work. You know, you, you don't use a Pekingese or a Pom or something like that. You want something that's that's close to being nearly a perfect dog. Mating a dingo with a domestic dog would have been the easy bit, but early attempts only partly succeeded. The offspring was simply too savage, too dingo-like. Then some canny cattlemen entered the picture. The Hall family came out and George Hall, the patriarch of that family, set up a, a, a string of properties that range from, you know, the, from the Hawkesbury River you know, in Sydney all the way up here into Queensland to Surratt in central Queensland. And that's where George Hall's younger son, Thomas, becomes pivotal to this story. You've got to remember that Thomas Hall was in charge of a, a string of cattle runs that totaled over a million acres and uh, spread from, from the Hawkesbury right through, right up to the Darling Downs. The Hall family in Northumbria used a dog called what we call the Drover's Cur, the Northumbrian Drover's Cur. Now, they weren't a breed, they were a type. So they were all very similar dogs, squarish in profile and tailless. They were naturally bobtailed, tailless dogs. Thomas Hall brought those dogs over very early in the 1820s, brought those dogs over from Northumbria and developed a breeding program at his place at Dartbrook near Aberdeen in the Hunter Valley. And he simply crossed the dingo with the cur and back crossed to that dingo. Over a period of about seven or eight years, he got the dog that he wanted. Thomas Hall must have been an exceptional dog breeder. He selected the traits that he most desired. And in no time, he had a dog that was predominantly blue in colour with a stumpy tail, both features of the Northumbrian cur. And this dog became Australia's first successful breed of dog. Some key details of the cattle dog's origins might have been lost for good, if not for 91-year-old Bert Howard. His late wife, Beryl, was a descendant of the Hall family. Fifty years ago, Bert began chasing family history. What became just an idle curiosity became a bit of an obsession over the years. He even crafted a detailed replica of the ship that brought the Hall family to Australia. Inevitably, he got on the scent of the cattle dog for a long time known as the Hall's Healer. G'day, Bert. G'day, Tim. Come on in. Thank you. Good. Good, Good. thank you. Let's talk dogs, eh? Talk dogs. <laughs> Why not? Where do we start? <laughs> Bert Howard's meticulous research shed new light on how Thomas Hall bred the dingo and the Northumbrian cur to create a new breed. He would have captured dingoes, eastern dingoes. Uh, they were available in the Hunter Valley. He would have captured those and he kept those in, in, uh, until they bred. And it was progeny from them that he matched to progeny from the imported dogs. And that's what he made it from. But he did, he started his program in 1825 and it was 1832 when he was quite satisfied with the cross he'd achieved. He'd done, and we don't know how many back crosses he did. So a new breed was born, called the Hall's Healer. Guy Hull describes it as an acclimatised dingo with the Kerr's working dog wiring. About 40 years later, the breed split in two directions. A stockman called Timmins developed a tailless version, known as the Timmins Biter. That's why today there's the stumpy tail cattle dog and its distant cousin, the tailed cattle dog. 
Vince and Joyce Musket have had a long time ongoing love affair with the latter. <laughs> Good to hell. Let's go play. Fellow owner and breeder, Bernadette Merchant is firmly in the Stumpy Tailed Club. Bernadette, tell us, how is the Stumpy Tail different from the, the Brush Tail Dog? The differences are quite obvious when you see the two together. A lot of people get them confused, but the Australian Cattle Dog is a more muscular dog. Um, they're slightly longer in body compared to height, and they carry a nice double coat. And um, yeah, they're physically stronger and tougher, I believe. And uh, yeah, I just love them to death, absolutely love them. From the cur, the cattle dog has inherited, you know, uh, you know, the working ability. Obviously, dingo has no working ability, but it, it, working ability. They were naturally suspicious of strangers, and they were very protective of their owner's property, and that just describes a cattle dog. There's just no question. Now, we'd always been told by Australia's great dog authority of the early, late nineteenth and early twentieth century, Robert Kolesky, that it was a cross between a dingo and a collie. There's nothing. There's no collie. There's no other, you know, in the original breed. Regrettably, when Thomas Hall died in 1870, his meticulous dog breeding records were destroyed. It was common knowledge then that uh, all Thomas's papers were dumped down one of these wells, which unfortunately they were lost forever. But some of the traits the Australian cattle dog inherited from the dingo are still readily apparent. Well, the Australian cattle dog's got a similar coat. It's, it's a double coat, which means it's very durable in, uh, in climatic conditions. There's a fine, dense, insulating undercoat and a longer, waterproof outer one. And the toughness of the dingo. Have you seen them kicked in the face? Oh, yes. Um, I've got cattle at home and I've taken a couple of good kicks from them. They just uh, get back up, shake their heads and just go back into it. They're amazing dogs. Stamina, they will, well, as you've seen, they'll go all day. They will not stop. They will just go all day till they basically drop from exhaustion. In Victoria's northeast, Di Thomas has had a lifelong love of Australian cattle dogs. My first red healer saved me off snakes, pushed me away from snakes going along the creek line, and so yeah, I've just grown up with the breed and love them. In recent years, the cattle dog, as opposed to the stumpy tailed variety, has become very popular as pets. And Di Thomas believes that has harmed its ability to work stock. Gradually, they're losing the instinct, and we're losing the bloodlines that can actually go out and work cattle like they should. Di Thomas is working towards breeding better working dogs. Thank you. The aim is to breed a dog that's biddable and can help you out in your situation, wherever that may be whether or not it's moving steers and heifers around or if it's the wild cattle up, you know, up the territory. It's, yeah, it comes down to the stockmen and what they can get out of the dog because the dogs have got the ability. It's just being able to tap into that. It's called a healer because it harries stock from behind. If need be, nipping at the heels of recalcitrant cattle, a trait that probably derives from the cur. It was the shock factor of the beast being bitten and not expecting it that startled the beast into, into movement. So a, one that stuck in a thicket that they couldn't get out normally, the yeah. dog could come round from the back and he'd very quickly get him out. It's time to um, get these healers back where they should be and doing what they're meant to do. The Australian cattle dog was popular in colonial times but began to fall out of favour from the 1880s when wire fences became common. Cattle became quieter dogs needed to be gentler and so began the glorious rise of the Kelpie. It's the greatest working dog ever developed, the Kelpie. Back here! Because of the Kelpie, wool growing was able to reach a truly industrial level in Australia and you know one man could manage you know huge mobs in huge paddocks with three or four dogs could do what half a dozen men or more you know you would need to do that work. The Kelpie was a God-given gift to the Australian sheep man. At a time when, when sheep were being released into huge paddocks, they could handle the heat, they had short coats, they were physically like the, the, the dingo in appearance, you know, if not in breeding. They were 
perfectly set up to handle these fa these fast moving merino sheep that were being bred in huge paddocks. Guy Harler has also shredded some myths about the kelpie, but above all, he puts the bite on self-appointed dog expert Robert Koleski. He exhibited cattle dogs and kelpies for a while, but basically everything Koleski wrote was a figment, figment of his imagination. All right? Koleski made, just made things up and positioned himself as the great champion of those breeds. And basically everything that he wrote, we sh Australians need to forget. I wrote this book in large part to correct all of the myths that we've been told by Robert Koleski. He even claimed to have developed the cattle dog breed. As a young man obsessed about dogs, Tony Parsons got to know Robert Koleski. Tony Parsons soon realised some of Koleski's claims were pure fiction. But Bert Howard has a soft spot for Robert Koleski for at least documenting some of the history of the cattle dog. We now call it the Australian cattle dog and it was his little group that, that dubbed that name to the dog. Originally they were called Hall's Healers. They then became Blue Healers. And when I was a young fella in the, in the bush, uh, we, we only ever knew them as Blue Healers. Uh, the Australian cattle dog uh, tag is, uh, is more popular now than it ever was in the old days. Well, the tailed version, that is. In recent years, the stumpy-tailed cattle dog has lost out to its bushy-tailed cousin. This is Shadow, with owner Kat Buckley from southern Queensland, who has had stumpies for more than 20 years. People don't appreciate the value of these dogs, the temperament of these dogs, the absolute lunacy sometimes of these stumpy tails, because their sense of humour is just sometimes too much you sort of go my god did you really do that and when you're feeling down they know and they will do their damnedest to make you feel happy and that's something i think is particular in this breed this breed is is just beautiful so how do you find the stumpy's temperament calf uh, placid yes exceptional loyal yes very intelligent yes too smart for their own good sometimes that's right once they accept you yeah. you've got a friend for life cat buckley is worried that being an uncommon breed Unless a careful breeding plan is soon put in place, the Stumpy Tail's gene pool could become dangerously shallow. Yeah. I'd hate to see the breed die. They're beautiful, they're the best breed. When people ask me, what breeds do you have, I write, I say there's only one. Dogs excite passion, and to this day, the odd mistruth. None more so than the history of the healer. He's five months. Is he? He's a beautiful boy. What class are you today? It seems a shame. You can go on the internet now and get thoroughly confused about the origins of the dog. And it's really a pretty straightforward story. Perhaps at last, the true origins of this famous Australian cattle dog are beyond dispute.